So in the recording about our introductory readings, I pointed out that both the Anglican theologians, Westberg, and Hauerwas, and the Roman Catholic theologians, Pinkhairs, and John Paul II, were all concerned about moral theology or Christian ethics understood only as being about adherence to the law. I want to emphasize this only. They don't think law has no importance for Christian ethics, but they are concerned about law being the totality of Christian ethics. And we see this in the reading and the scriptural warrant for this in the reading from Matthew in Veritatis Splendor, where the young man comes to Jesus and says, I've kept all of the law. And Jesus says, then follow me. This is the story John Paul II uses to orient us to this discussion. So there's this overarching concern about understanding ethics as tied as being only about discerning the moral law and then following it. Like I said, it doesn't mean no moral law, but too much emphasis on the moral law. And this is what, in our first session, we are going to call the idea of a morality of obligation. The uh, technical philosophical term for this is deontology, understanding morality as only being about following the law. And our argument for this class is that we have to understand Christian ethics as going beyond, although not excluding, law. So I'm going to give you all some historical background as to why and how we ended up with this being such a concern, both for Roman Catholics and for, at the very least, um, Anglican, Anglican Protestants. So in the schools of the Middle Ages, there was a standard textbook called the Commentary on the Sentences by Peter Lombard. I'm sure you probably talked about this in some of your church history classes. And Lombard collected snippets from all of the patristic authors and put them together to provide an intro textbook to their theology, because of course most people without a printing press only had, didn't have access to a wide, you know, like a wide range of books, a wide library like we have today. And so this textbook sort of introduced people to the teaching of the Christian tradition. And he provides a really important definition. He says, free will is that faculty of reason and will whereby one chooses the good with the help of grace or evil without this help. So he creates the discussion around this idea that we are capable of choosing the good according to our free will with the help of grace or choosing evil and that free will exists in our reason and in our will and in this place he means will as our uh, capacity to, de to desire and execute and reason of course means our reasoning faculties our ability to think and in the main Thomistic tradition, the main Catholic tradition, this sentence was taken up and understood that our ability to choose proceeds from our reason and our desires, which combine together to make an, a choice. Um, and we are, under this theory, but to articulate by Thomas Aquinas, we are oriented to the good. What sin has done to us is that it's made us, it's made it hard for us to discern what the good is. Um, so here's an example. I've got toddlers. And under this theory, my toddlers have a deep desire to eat. And as they develop their reasoning faculties and get bigger, they have, they know that eating will make them feel good. Um, however, they do not know because of, let's just say because of sin, the appropriate way to satisfy or what, satisfy what both their reason and their desire tells them they want food. So if I gave them the choice according to their free will, 
they would only eat goldfish. But that doesn't mean that this base orientation to eating is wrong. It's actually a good desire. It's something that's appropriate for their human flourishing. If they don't eat, they won't grow. Um, but it has to be oriented and properly formed in the right way. So free will is the faculty of reason and will, whereby one chooses a good with the help of grace, or in, in this analogy of my toddlers, with the help of your mother not letting me eat goldfish every meal, and evil, only eating goldfish without this help. But it's there's a basic orientation to the good. Um, so this is sort of one approach to Christian moral theology. The other approach, and this is what Pinkers talks about, arises in a theory called nominalism. And there's a lot of philosophical stuff that comes along with nominalism. Um, and we can talk about this more in the discussion. For our purposes, part of nominalism, part that's articulated by a man named William of Ockham, is that this sentence by Peter Lombard, free will is that faculty of reason and will whereby one chooses the good or evil, indicates not that our free choice comes out of our reason and our will that orients us to the good and then may kind of get derailed, but rather that free will precedes reason and will so that deep down inside us, we all make a choice and then that choice is harmonized with our reason and will um to be truly free he says our this basic desire can't be controlled by anything it can't be controlled by a natural orientation to the good and it can't be proved by reason i want because i want not because my desires and my intellect direct me to some good, that because of sin I misunderstand. And the reason for this is Occam's political convictions. Occam was an absolute monarchist, and he did not want there to be any control on a king's actions. And so he said, we can't, you can't come back and say to a king, well, when you make a decision, your decision needs to be controlled by the good that you have discerned with your reason or the good that you desire for the love of your subjects. No. The king gets to want what the king wants. This means having absolute power. And so what happens is once you start thinking about an earthly king this way, it's easy to start thinking about God this way. That God is restrained by this free will. God's free will is perfectly good because God is good, not by reason. And so whereas most time in the Christian tradition, we would say, well, God's, what God is going to tell us to do or what God is going to expect from us is constrained by the choices God made us made at creation. God made us certain types of beings and he is only going to tell us what to, what to do in accordance with the type of being we are. Like God wouldn't tell us, um, to commit suicide, for example, because that would be out of alignment with the type of living beings God has made us to do. Um, Occam would say, no, God can tell you anything he wants. And you have to do it. You have to obey unconditionally. So what this meant for ethics is that in the in this first sense, the way I was described, remember like my kids are hungry and they I have to direct them to the right 
to have to direct their natural instincts to its proper fulfillment. So not just eating goldfish all the time, but eating the food that is good for them. That at least I tell them like, hey, you eat enough broccoli, eventually you're going to come to like broccoli and you'll like it more because it'll make you feel better. Um, this is off the table under Occam's schemes. Morality isn't linked to a natural, any type of good that we are oriented to. Rather, morality is only understood as God's law, the law God gives us according to his will. There isn't a connection between God's, what God tells us and the type of creatures that we are. So for Occam, the way we connect with God is through the law, through doing whatever God tells us to. And this becomes all of morality. And these ideas that morality is just about law, over time, in certain strands of Roman Catholic theology, mean that everything becomes about law and not about relationship. Because the only way you connect to God is through the law, not through sort of a connection of being the type of beings we are that God made us. So Martin Luther comes along and Martin Luther says, this doesn't make, this isn't like, where, where's grace in here? All the grace, you know, you do the good because through God's grace, this is all fallen out. This is just about you keep the law or you go to hell. And so his solution, very crudely put, is to say, well, what God gives us the law to condemn us. But what, um, the way salvation works is realizing that Jesus has fulfilled all of the law, has stood in our place, has paid the price for us, for our disobedience of the law. And now we, we're going to talk about, when we read Luther um, this afternoon, when we read Freedom of the Christ, Christ, Christian, now we don't need to worry about the law because we're not under its penalty. We're able to have a relationship with God because Jesus has restored this and thrown out the law. You can you can see how a lot of folks got really nervous about Luther saying this because and, and this wasn't Luther, but a lot of people heard Luther and said, "Well, fine, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm just reconciled to Christ through grace and faith, and I might as well just do whatever I want." And this wasn't I mean, this isn't what Luther says, but this is the way that either Luther was received or people were worried that Luther would be received. And this is why there isn't a lot on Lutheran ethics out there. There's not a big focus in Lutheran thought about, well, what do I do? The focus rather is on this relationship with God in which Christ fulfills the law and we are removed from its condemnation. Um, so since we're talking about morality, I'm going to talk about some in the next lecture for Morality of Heaven, I'm going to talk about some later developments. Um, so here's what happens. There is a young German philosopher who was raised in a Lutheran pietistic household, and his name is Immanuel Kant. And he want, he seeks to restore a system of morality that doesn't depend on Christianity. Post Enlightenment people, not ever. And I, I, there's a lot of debate about what Kant himself believed, but he's trying to find a way to say that morality is there is a morality that's possible without religion that everyone can agree on. But he's Lutheran, and so he's grown up with this sharp law grace dichotomy, this division, and so his solution is that. The law, that we all do have to agree to a law, but because people don't believe in God or are questioning the existence of God, we can find a law we give ourselves. This law is called the categorical imperative, which is basically, um, to summarize very crudely, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so you can build a system of morality based on this law that you've given yourself. And so post-Kant, most philosophical reflection is focused on this idea of determining the proper law. And this seeps into Christian theology. Um, we're going to talk, we'll talk in class about John Calvin 
and what Karl Barth's doing and how Karl Barth and Calvin are kind of trying to develop and appropriate this idea. But this is sort of the historical strand. Um, and we'll, the Barth reading's hard, we'll go through it slowly. That's our main focus. But I want you to